before you open your Bibles up to Matthew chapter 21. This is just an introductory verse, but we'll be flipping back to Matthew 8 and 9 in a moment. I want to begin reading in verse 1. Matthew chapter 21, start reading in verse 1. And when they drew nigh to Jerusalem, they were come to Bethphage, unto the house, or to the Mount of Olives. Then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied and a colt with her, loose them, and bring them unto me. If any man say aught unto you, you shall say, <coughs> The Lord has need of them, and straightway he will send them. Let us pray. Us, Father, I thank you as we begin now with this time, Lord, that you would speak. Again, Lord, the Lord has need. So, Lord, again, our hearts are in need of many things today, and we come before you, Lord, for it. We thank you that you are the provider of those needs. And again, Lord, there is substance and sustenance for all, food, clothes, water, the basics, Lord, of life, that you are Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides and gives. And yet, Lord, it is, is that there are many needs that are cried out today of those, Father, that may be worldly or selfish. But, Lord, again, in your grace and mercy, Lord, you are enough. So, Lord, as we look to you, as we think upon these verses and these things of spiritual needs, Lord, that are even now on so many hearts and minds, Father, I cry out to you, do your work. Do your Holy Spirit's best work in the lives and the souls of these, your people. To those, Father, that are without you and need you, to those, Lord, that are not here, Lord, the need is, is upon this hour. Lord, again, that you would answer. And I thank you and all I praise you, Lord, for all of these sufficiencies that you have provided and that you will provide, because you are faithful. In Jesus' name I ask and pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> over, I listen and overhear the, some of the conversations and get-togethers and people out and about in the community, and you start hearing them, what do you want for Christmas? And you see the kids with their list, and I found this app now. You remember the, remember the old days was that you was handed a Sears catalog and said, here you go. Does that bring back a couple of memories for some? Uh, page after page, looking through there, I want, I want, I want, I want. Uh, and again, Joy when you got it, unfair when you didn't get it, maybe. Uh, Dad always used to tell a story, he said there were seven of us, and we got one ball between the seven of us, and we was happy to have it, you know, to make you feel appreciative of whatever you had, because we were spoiled. Uh, but I listen to people, what they want, what they need. There are faces that are needed. Again, you appreciate that. I think about so often, I've seen enough pictures now with the internet that takes you halfway around the world and you see people that get up and uh, I'm able to go to the cupboard and to pull out something to eat and to have sufficient. I think about those that got up this morning and they don't even know where the food is for today, let alone tomorrow or the rest of this week. That is a bewilderment almost in this day and age. They, they need the basics, they don't have them. Uh, we have the basics, and so often because we've been so accustomed to it, we take it for granted. But boy, I'm telling you, let the power go out, and the water pumps be shut off, and the electric and the heat goes, and then boy, we are appreciative of it, aren't we? Isn't it awful that we always have to lose it sometimes to make us appreciate it? Well, I come through this, and I, I remembered this passage of Scripture. Again, this is, again, the triumphal entry of Christ in Matthew 21, because Christ is getting ready to, to ride on the animal into the city of Jerusalem, and then again later to be uh, betrayed, crucified, and set into plan the message of his death and his resurrection. And you said, well, that's Easter, Dan. That's not good. We're at Christmas. Get your, get your holidays right. Don't forget, the translation of holidays are holy days. 
You know, the world has gobbled up our holy days and cremated. Uh, just devastated Christmas, you know, the celebration of the church, of Christ, and now it's turned into this conglomerate of everything else but. Easter is not a holiday, it's a holy day. It's our Lord's resurrection. It's everything and again. It's not the physical date of, and the holiday of celebration that we put into so much of it. It's the remembrance and the celebration of worship. This is what my Lord did for me. And so you say, well, this was Easter, Dan, and, and it is. But the statement in verse 3 that I want you to remember, Mark, <coughs> as we go back in three other passages of Scripture this morning of needs, the Lord has need of this. Again, it was the animal for this context of the scripture, but I'm left with that. What what does the Lord need in this day and age? And again, he, he needs his people. The Lord sits on his throne and is unable, un, not because he can't do it, but he has set it into motion that he cannot respond until his people know that they need him. Now we sing that old song, I need you every hour, and I... I take the right to change that. I don't need you every hour. I need you every moment. And so I say, and it's been my focus so often, and again, I, I chastise myself when minute by minute, moment by moment, Lord, let me be available to you, servant to you. Minute by minute, moment by moment. That's my thought. That's my prayer. Normally when I wake up in the morning, Lord, go before me. For what the day may hold. Minute by minute, moment by moment. And I look out there in this and the Lord waits for those that will have a heart that is ready to say, Lord, I need you. And to say, Lord, and the Lord looks back and says, I need you. I need the church to be light out here in this world of darkness. Men love darkness rather than light. Do you agree with that? Oh, look at the world headlines. They just shatter. Decency. They just shattered the normalcy that we once knew. They need light. They need Christ. And so that message comes to us. I know that there are those that sit today and they need a hug. They need a prayer. They need a promise. They need attention. I know those things. I know the basic needs, the physical needs. People need around the world need food. They need water. They need medicine. And you wish in your heart cry is to say, I wish that we could just be uh, that giver and to say, I want to meet everybody's needs, but that's not possible. The one thing is that the Lord has need of them, and that's his people. Come to me. Be used of me in this season of holiday, holy day, that we can celebrate Christmas as it was intended to be. Because Christ knew what we would need. The Father knew what we would need, didn't he? He knew that we would need Satan. He knew that we would be in sin. He knew that we would need this message of hope and eternal life. To those that embrace it, there's nothing better. How many have rejected it? Names and faces pop in my head so fast I can't even name them all. But I set them before the Lord one by one. And I said, Lord, they need you. So I want to give you these three passages of scripture that gives to us a little bit more specific message of what the need is. The Lord needs these things that we have referred to in that, and this is what the people need. So back in Matthew chapter 8 verse 2, if you follow along with me, there's three passages I want to give. Matthew chapter 8 is our first one. Begin reading in verse 1. And when he was come down from the mountain, Great multitudes followed him. Behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand, and he touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Again, we look at this and we'll ask the question, what does this guy need? Well, he's had leprosy, and that's a life-threatening disease. We, we have multitudes of those today, life-threatening diseases, and none of you want to go to the doctor and hear that. I watched the, uh, again, these are remedial judgments on our nation, because again, it just it hasn't always been this way. 
But isn't it an awful thing for these people back in the summer that they go jump in an old pond? Y'all remember going and jumping in the river? Going over South Branch? Going to a pond, somebody's backyard? And yeah, barrels of fun. Old tire swing, uh, and just out into the river you went, and, and good, innocent, fun-filled days. But uh, how many? Every week this past summer, there was another one that went to a water park, that went to a pond, that was down in the waters of South Carolina there, and they get this amoeba that breathed up in their, in their nostrils, and it, and it eats their brain, and they have less than 48 hours. That fast, that quick, and nobody, nobody, to go jump in a, in a water hole and think, boy, this is fun, this is fun, to say, okay, now I've got to second guess whether I'm going to go to the river or not, whether I'm going to go jump in the pond or not. Life-threatening diseases, that's pretty fast. Gatlinburg, we've seen the devastation of the fire, and, and I saw the, uh, that couple that was 80 years old in their testimony, they had to walk out of that inferno that was engulfing them on all sides and how fast the fire ravages and comes up on them, right? Life threat. We see these things as they're happening. Leprosy was this for this day and time uh, back out on the west coast and some of you that are a whole lot older than I am, I won't say any names or anything, but you remember the fear of polio, right? Smallpox. Now all of a sudden they got the uh, shots, they've got the antibiotics, and, and all of that generally is taken care of. But now, more recently, it seems every year, there's some of those old diseases cropping back up, uh, impacting in a city, an area, and lives are threatened once again in this. Jesus comes into the city, he comes down off of the mountain, every time he was up on the mountain, generally he was doing what? He was praying, wasn't he? So he comes down off of the mountain, the multitudes were following him. They followed him because they needed something. He knew that he couldn't minister to them because he needed something. And so he got what he needed where he was supposed to get it, in the presence of the Lord. You will have no power to help those that are in need out there unless you're in your quiet, secret closet in close communion and intimacy with the Lord in prayer. Too many prayer closets have too many cobwebs gathered around, too much clutter in the way that they can't get to it because it's not of importance. But boy, isn't it important when a life-threatening disease comes, when a life-threatening sorrow comes. I list these things all the time. I deal with them all the time. Some people embrace them, but most of the time, most people don't embrace them. I saw in November that the police officers that set a record for 2016 for the most deaths in service. You know, the last one was out there in Tacoma, Washington. We saw the answer prayer at Ohio State uh, with that because of a crazed man, evil in that, life-threatening things. But again, everybody got up and was going to work and going to classes and they didn't think a thing about it until the tragedy and the calamity was already on the news. It was nice for me to be able to come out of my prayer closet, to come out of Sunday worship last week. And the first thing Monday morning as I'm sitting down and I'm reading my passages of Scripture and I'm writing my notes and I'm doing my, my quiet time with the Lord is that the Holy Spirit speaks to me and He says, Hey, something's not right out there. I didn't know what it was. I, I couldn't put my finger on it. I have my prayer group text with about a couple dozen people on it. I sent the text out. I said, the Lord spoke. I don't know what's wrong. I don't know what's happening. But something's not right. Let's pray. And so different ones write back as they're able to. And they said, praying, praying against evil. It's not the physical. It's the spirit. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of it. What is affecting the minds of people? What's affecting the lives of people? It's not God. It's not the light of the world. It's the darkness. It's the enemy. It's Satan. That's what we're fighting against. They need deliverance from this evil. Jesus prayed that. He said, deliver them from evil or from the evil one. You know anybody bound? You know anybody shackled? That song? Uh, yeah. Next. 
Chat, I can't even call it mine now. I can get part of it there. Uh, huh? He touched me. Right. Shackled uh, in the midst of that and delivered. I had part of it. Isn't that all? Uh, Y'all told me that those days were coming. So, amen. There you happy? It's it. But the idea of this is, is that there are people that are out there shackled in the midst of this. And there is no one. There is not man, method, or means that can deliver them in this. They need Christ, the great deliverer, the great I am. There was no one. There was no disease. There was no medicines. There was no doctors. There was nothing there that could cure them of this leprosy. This was a death sentence to get leprosy. And this leper came to the one that was the one, only one that could help him in his need. I am glad for those that come to Christ and have said, I have tried everything else, but there is no one that can help me but you. And that means is that they are willing to throw their whole heart and soul and mind to him and say, Lord, I need you. Minute by minute, moment by moment, deliver me, help me. And he says, if you would, Lord, if you want to, again, the will of the Father. What's the will of the Father? I've had so many people ask me to pray prayers. And say, this is what I want. Often, I can't pray that. I have to pray, thy will be done, Lord, because I can't pray, be found praying amiss. I can't be found praying against God, because that's of no avail. What does the Lord mean in the circumstance and situation? And so in this is that the man comes to Christ and says, this is what I need. Mean. If you will, you can make me whole. And I wasn't going to add it, but I decided to in verse 3, the answer of Christ I will. Be thou made whole. What a great word. Christ speaks the word. The need is met. That man who got up with the death sentence on him is now able to go back home to his family and to say, look what the Lord has done for me. And again, that's the temple. That's the physical. Well, what good does it do for this man to be healed of leprosy if he dies and goes to I often ask that question. Why be brought into this world? This is that dialogue that I go back and forth with with God. Why do you have 7 billion people to be born into this world and, and, and your desire is that none should perish, none should go away from you, Lord? You sent Christ, you came in Advent as the Savior of the world so that all could be saved. Why would you allow for them to be born only to see them die and go to hell? Lord, this is an imbalance. Why? They need you. And again, I know they reject him. You know, everybody that rejects the invitation, everybody that drives by the church when they know the church services are happening, that says, I don't got time for that, I'm not interested in that. They are jumping over all these things that God has set in the way of, of keeping them from going into him. There are individuals that jump over prayers, go around them, barrel through them. There are those who shed the tears for their loved ones, and, and that person uh, undoes those things because of the hardness of their heart. They turn a deaf ear to those that are trying to speak to them. They harden their hearts. They have a seared conscience. They reject every invitation that God is setting into motion because of the need that the leprosy upon them, the spiritual need of sin. If you would, Lord, you can make them clean. I pray every day for those that are lost in sin that God would give me the desire of my heart and say, I will. They'll be made whole. Those that are in darkness, those that are lost, those that are on their way to hell, I've heard your prayer, Dan. I've heard your, I've heard your heart cry. I was waiting for one that would pray the prayer of my heart. I would that none would perish. Seek and save, Lord, that which is lost. I will be thou made holy. I can't tell you is that, you know, Georgia used to have it. She'd set up the 25 days till Christmas, and uh, every day there'd be a piece of chocolate in there for the kids to open it up, and uh, that was the little routine in that until the uh, uh, itchy fingers uh, got into the chocolate before it was time. Uh, and so, amazingly, the, the Christmas mice come out and eat the chocolate before it was able to uh, be gotten to, and, and so kind of missed on that. But wouldn't it be a wonderful Christmas thing uh, for the next 21 days? Every day, God gives us a soul that can be saved. I will. 
and be thou made whole. The desire of your heart for your son, your daughter, your husband, your wife, your mother, your father, your neighbor, your in law, I will. Be thou made whole. What do you want? What do you need? The Lord give us all. You should know it as well as anybody. People aren't coming to Christ, then where is the church going to be in the next 10, 20 years? If people aren't coming in and hearing the gospel and responding to the gospel, where will the church be? Lord, we need, we need for people to respond to the invitation. We need people to be surrendered to you. And again, that's not a physical need, that's a spiritual need. And that is greater. You can heal everybody of cancer. You can heal everybody of heart disease. You can heal everybody uh, of all these diseases of life threatening that are out there. And they will still die and go to hell. So what can this do to heal them? It is no good to heal them physically if they die spiritually. <coughs> we need our spiritual wholeness. And only Christ can do that. Right over from chapter 8 is the next need that is there upon our heart cries today. Found in Matthew chapter 9. Down around verse, you can start reading in verse 20, but it's found in verse 21. And behold, a woman which was diseased with the issue of blood for 12 years, she came behind him. She touched the hem of his garment. She said within herself, If I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. Now, this is the personal need. Again, a physical need, she's got a blood issue. First thing you do when you go to the doctors normally, they take your vitals, right? Temperature, blood pressure. They look you over, and then the next thing they want to say is, as a vampire, give us a pint of blood. It's always the blood work, isn't it? The life of the flesh, back over in the book of Leviticus, the life of the flesh is found in the blood. Your blood counts reveal everything about you. I often uh, said, as a matter of fact, me and Georgia was talking about it yesterday when we was talking about uh, chemical imbalances in people. But one people says, oh, that's a chemical imbalance. And I said, no, it's not a chemical imbalance. It's a demon. It's evil. That's what controls people in some of these things. Not that there's not chemical imbalances, because I always refer to old Mr. Krause. Mr. Krause was a, a man who was aging up in his 80s. All of a sudden, he had a mood swing. He, became, he was always the most gentle, most tender-hearted guy that you could possibly sit and talk to. Uh, but he would do a 180 and get violent and, and, and curse and just act like he just completely lost his mind. Memory uh, wasn't that he had Alzheimer, but they said dementia is setting in upon him. Took him to the doctor. Had to, of course, they thought it was just dementia in the uh, mental hygiene evaluation with all that that went into place. But then they did the blood work. And they found out that his potassium had bought him down. And isn't it amazing that as soon as they got his potassium up, you know what happened to him? Perfectly fine. Mind was restored. Mood swings were gone because of potassium levels. That's a chemical imbalance. But when a guy takes a car and drives it through a bunch of students and gets out with a knife and tries to stab people all for the sake of all, that's not a chemical imbalance. That's a demon. That's evil. There are those that come with heart cries today saying, Lord, I need you. Not just for the physical. This one came because of the physical. I can just touch the hem of his garment. I'm telling you, I've been in prayer meetings, I've been at altar calls, an invitation, when a person in desperation of their heart was at this altar and they was either prostrate or laid out across, there was always one or two steps, laid out across the steps, and even though there was nobody in front of them, you could see them doing it, they was reaching out to touch the hem of his garments. I am not an arrogant, self-righteous man to come into the throne room of God and say, well, Lord, here I am. Let's have a chair. Let's have, have a seat. I'm not like that. I know better than that. And you should too. You come humbly into the throne room of God. And if there's nothing else that I can do, I can touch his nail scar I don't come in arrogantly as to say, well, Lord, I'm here. He was expecting me. I come in with that gentle spirit like this woman did. If I, I don't need his full attention. I just need to touch the hem of his garment. And I know that there are things on your mind this morning sitting here 
There are people in your heart this morning as you're sitting here. And this is what we need. If I can just touch him. What did Jesus do when, he, when she touched him? He stopped. And he turned and he addressed her. And there are a thousand prayer requests going up. And there are, there are tens of thousands of people at altars this morning and in the pews this morning worshiping God across this nation. And they're crying out to God for their needs. Lord, I need you. My loved ones need you. Our nation needs you. That's the cry. But not God doesn't stop for all of them and turn back to them and say, I have heard you. And I have seen you and I have responded to you. Most of the time, most people come into church, get the worship experience, go right back out the same way that they come in. What a, what a failure. What a waste of time to miss God at the most pivotal point of our day, of our week. The climax of everything that you did from Sunday through Saturday gets you ready for this one hour that we come in. And we come in here, uh, come, supposed to come in at the at the peak of it, that you have built yourself up. But normally that's the reverse. We have drained ourselves Monday through Saturday, and we come in here uh, as beggarly thieves, saying, "Lord, I'm telling you, I just barely made it in here. What a week! I'm telling you, I hope this week was not like last week. Drained. And Lord, I just need a fill up. Please fill me up." And they. They, they try to live off of that. This woman came in that one experience and she said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, all will be well. And I can't tell you. Share how many people I would like to do that today. Touch the hem of his garment. How many people will miss it? The last one that I come to is over in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37. Ezekiel 37. What else is needed? Lord, if you will, you could make me clean. Matthew 8. Matthew 9, Lord, if you would just, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, it'll be okay. And in verse 30, in Ezekiel 37, the miracle of light. The hand of the Lord was upon me. Verse 1, begin reading. The hand of the Lord was upon me. He carried me out in the spirit of the Lord, and he set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. He caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in that open valley. Lo, they were very dry. He said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophesy unto these bones, and say unto them, O you dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you. You shall live. And so we see the third need that is met here. God breathing into dead bones life. For most of you I have asked at one point or another, tell me about the day of your salvation. Tell me about that day that Christ breathed life into you, that you was dead in trespasses and sins, and now you're alive in Christ. Sadness for those of you that aren't able to tell me that. Sadness of that birth, that regeneration, that you don't have a testimony. You don't have the ability to say, I know that I know that I know that I'm saved. Christ came into my life that day and everything changed. I watch people today, they know it up here, but they don't know it here. Christ wants to breathe into them. The invitation has been given. Prophesy unto them. Hear the word of the Lord. You know, most people won't even come to church to hear the word of the Lord. God listen to somebody, oh, well, I'm watching so-and-so on, on television, this preacher or that preacher, I automatically cringe. Because of some, most of those that are out there today. Now, when I hear that there are some of those that are, you know, Charles Stanley or someone like that, I, I take joy because I know he preaches and teaches the word. But oh, for anybody that's ever sat underneath the me and said, I listen to Joel Olstein. I just want to Uncover an eye. Had somebody give me a Christmas present like that as a joke. Don't know who I did. <laughs> Wrote me up a Christmas. Hey, I wanted to give this to you, preacher, because I love you. Open that thing up, and it was a Joel Olstein. I said, oh, good. Good fire starter for the fire. Well, we all saw a guy yesterday, pastor at the Kaiser Assembly, and they got him a, uh, 
a nice uh, winter coat with the, these Green Bay Packers fans. So you had Green Bay Packers on that. And I said, boy, that's the best gift that they got you for oil and grease rags. Hey, shut up. Don't, don't want to hear that. You know why? Because Joel Steen don't preach the truth. He lies to people. He even says that. He says, I'm not a proclaimer. I'm an entertainer. His father preached the word. His father declared the truth. But he doesn't. And he's made millions off of people believing lies. He's dangerous. Hear the word of the Lord. So sit and listen to lies because they won't come and hear the truth. I had a woman that was down in Frederick, Maryland. Went to over, went to over 100 churches. She took pad and paper and went to every church, every denomination that was there, looking for a preacher that preached the word and a preacher that prayed. And that was the two questions. She would meet, she would meet the pastor after every church service, and she said, What do you believe about the word of God? And she said, over 80 to 90 percent of them said, We don't believe this book, that's why we don't preach it. There was a guy right over across the bridge here that stood in the pulpit back in the 1980s and said, I don't preach the word of God, but he did stand up in the pulpit with the Reader's Digest and give the people that for 10 minutes and say, God bless you all until we meet again next Sunday. Well, woe unto a man like that. Woe unto a church like that. Or how about that woman that was down there in the short cap that stood up, especially here at Christmas, and said, Jesus Christ is not the only way of salvation to get into heaven. In a Protestant church, guy asked me, he said, what would you do? I said, I'd stand up and throw a hip book at her and said, bye, bye, and walk out the door. I never entered into that church, never addressed that woman, but I did get in my prayer closet, and I said, God, that just makes me sick. Take that woman out of it. Remove her. And I thank God for that call that morning I got and said, guess who resigned yesterday? Thank you, Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. You can't get saved without the word of God. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by what? The word of the Lord. Prophesy unto them. Preach. Proclaim to them truth. What message did you proclaim this year to your family and your friends? What message did you proclaim this past week to co-workers, neighbors, and family? I didn't promise anything to them, then they are in need of the word of truth. Prophesy to them these words live. Hear the word of the Lord and live. I'm telling you, it is my greatest desire in all my heart cry today for those that are in the gospel message of the needs. Oh God, if you would, if you would do it, it'll be done. I love it. The woman with the blood issue, the dry bones, the dead bones. Oh God, breathe life into us. You're getting ready to finish out this year. You're getting ready to go into your Christmas celebration, and family and friends are watching you on all sides. What what do they need? Well, they need some slippers. Well, they need some aftershave. Well, they need some candy. Well, those are all physical. What do they need spiritually? They need Jesus. They walked up and down in the Christmas parade the other night. You know how many candy canes I got from the <coughs> churches? My dentist loves them. I appreciate those candy canes. That was nice. That was a nice gift. People don't need candy canes. People need Jesus. People need light. People need Christ. They need Christ this Christmas. Because they're lost and perishing. You say, I know that. They don't know that. Too many sit in the church and they know this truth, but they never tell the truth. And that's the reason that you have to go to them. What do you need this Christmas? And they'll give you their Christmas list. Where's Jacob at? What do you want for Christmas? 170 items on that Christmas list. Man. Now that's, that's acting in faith. If you don't ask, you don't get. That's that mindset. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Would you ask of the Lord this week? 
what needs were met there. Oh God, we need you. Back, back in the 90s, I think it was, was that Casting Crown sang a song, Lord, if we ever needed you, it's too bad. I often go back to that old song. I like those old songs, kind of. I, I, they're not old, but it's, they resonate with me. I see all the headlines and all the activities that are out in this world today. Lord, we need you. More than yesterday, I go back to work, I go down to Walmart sheets, and I see people out and about like they have a conversation. Lord, we need you. I come into the church and I watch people's lives. They need you. Struggles, attacks, suffering, sorrow, physical, spiritual, emotional. Or we need you. Minute by minute, moment by moment. And you've said it, you've thought it. How do people make it without the price? But they're making it. They won't make it out of the need you. We need Christ every day, every hour in our life. Bear in mind, cleanse me. If thou wilt, you can make me clean. Lord, I got a blood issue. It's called sin. I need you to touch the hem of your garments and be made whole because what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Lord, these old dry bones. They were dead. You breathed life into me and I became a living soul for you. And I live for you, Lord, and I will live for you the rest of this month, the rest of this year, the rest of this day, the rest of this week, minute by minute, moment by moment. Occupy my thoughts, occupy my language, occupy my deeds. Take me, Lord, because they need you. And each day, set someone in front of me, Lord, that I can give to them words of eternal life that they may